spent some time abroad, especially in Italy, and they came home to England wearing the the uh, flamboyant dress that they had picked up, and often that was plumes in the hat. And as a, a slang term for them was to call them a macaroni. <laughs> and for Americans who are, uh, sorry, uh, United States people who are familiar with the, the couplet from Yankee Doodle Dandy, there's a line that says, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. That is a reference to the same slang term for somebody dressing with a, a stylish hat with plumes. So that's where the macaroni gets its name. There's the royal penguin found just on one island south of Tasmania. Oh, Tasmania and the Snares and penguin, one island south of New Zealand. Oh, and the yeah, southern rockhopper penguin, go which go go does go go occur go in the go southern go parts go of go Argentina go and go Chile. Go it's also found in the Falklands Malvinas. There's a northern rockhopper that has slightly more punkish hairstyle that's found on islands further north in the Atlantic, like Tristan de Cunha. In New Zealand, we have the very odd looking yellow eyed penguin. And there's also the Waitaha penguin, which, as you'll note, I don't have a picture of because it's extinct. And it was only discovered about 10 years ago from the middens of early Polynesian settlers in New Zealand. And the Waitaha penguin wiped out about 500 years ago by over-harvesting as a, as a food source. And it's the, the first penguin uh, that we know of that humans have extirpated anywhere in the world. The little penguin. Uh, Australians know this as the fairy penguin. New Zealanders also have them, and we call them little blue penguins there. But it's the world's smallest penguin. They nest in burrows. Some of you may have been to Phillip Island in Victoria, Australia, and seen the little penguin there. And then there's the chrome-plated cocktail penguin. <laughs> Highly social, but not colonial. And the temperate penguins, sometimes called the striped penguins, this is the Magellanic penguin, and many of you will be seeing these birds tomorrow because they they nest in Argentina and Chile, they nest in Falklands Malvinas, they are found in the southern cone of South America. Amazing birds, they're living in a very hot place. The summer temperatures can be quite high, and you'll notice on the face they've got some exposed skin. And again, this is for temperature control. The feathers work as insulation, so if you have some skin without feathering, it can be a great place to suffuse it with blood and share that heat with the atmosphere. And so the, the uh, Magellanic penguins do quite a bit of that. They nest in burrows, which also allows for a little more temperature control and protection from foxes and skunks and armadillos and things that would like to eat the eggs. On the other side of the Atlantic, Africa has a single species of penguin, the African penguin, sometimes called the black-footed or jackass penguin. Oh, yeah, jackass. The term jackass penguin is because of the, the call it makes sounds very much like a donkey braying. Don't but the problem with using that term is that there are other places in the world where other species are called jackass penguins. So the official name is the African penguin. And there's also a penguin on the left, found off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and this penguin is the only one that will allow you to win an argument and trivia over are there any penguins in the world? Because the Galapagos straddle is the and technically, occasionally, some Galapagos penguins possibly forage in the sea just north of the equator. So I'll leave that to you to argue at your next uh, pub trivia. In the Antarctic Peninsula, the region we're visiting, are chinstrap penguins. And we hope to see chinstrap penguins in our voyage. Here's a lovely, cute little penguin chick. And you'll note it's a small penguin chick. And that's because it's still young enough that it hasn't gotten dirty. This is the penguin chick photo you never see in the calendars. But this is very typical of a penguin chick during the breeding season because they're, they're, they're growing up but they're not going to change their feathers for two months. And they also don't go into the sea to wash because down feathers are not good at insulating in water. They're great in the air but they don't help in the water. So these birds 
are going to wear whatever mud or guano or whatever they get on them for the full two months. These birds are very healthy, by the way, the ones in the picture here. They're, they're doing fine. They just look, you know, not very cuddly. The Gen 2 penguin is one I think we're highly likely to see. They're found in Falklands and Malvinas, but also in a couple of places in the Beagle Channel near Ushuaia and in the Antarctic Peninsula. And like all the penguins, they feed their chicks by direct regurgitation, where they vomit up food directly into the mouth of the chick. It uh, kind of looks like they're biting the heads off their babies, but uh, don't worry, they do still grow to maturity. And the basic penguin for most people's imagination is the Adélie penguin. Simple, black and white, and this bird is found only in the Antarctic and all around the Antarctic, in all, all parts. Now we're going to walk through a little bit of the, the breeding life of these penguins, and we're looking out of a helicopter here, about 4,000 feet up, and to the practiced eye you can see the penguin colonies because they're a different color from the basic rock. And that different color is the pinkish tone that you're seeing in the, the mid foreground there. If it's plain tan rock, that's just rock, but the, the pinkish stuff, that's penguin guano. Krill, that shrimp-like crustacean that they eat, has a pink pigment in it. And the penguin gut does not process that, so it passes out with the feces. And penguins keep coming back to the same colony year after year, century after century, and so in the Antarctic environment where that's not uh, decomposing very quickly, it leaves a layer of guano with a pink color to it. And so you can spot a penguin colony from quite a long ways away. And you can also smell them from a long way away too, which uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out a way to, to bring that odor into the room here, but <laughs> something to look forward to. These are claw marks in rock by penguins who have walked up this same path for years, decades, centuries. And because of that, their claws have etched into this quartzite rock. They are creatures of habit. And they, most of the penguins like to nest in groups with other members of the same species. They like to be together, but not too close. The idea is that you take a space and you defend that space, but if I'm, if I'm nesting here and I can bite you, on, if you're my neighbor, and I can bite you without getting up from my nest, I'm going to bite you, <laughs> and the same vice versa. Yeah, and so what you find is the penguins all end up being about just out of beak range from one another. Just by putting a, a penguin toy on the edge of a colony, it was very quickly savaged. Where a penguin nests has big implications. These penguins have chosen poorly because they've got a creek running through their colony now. The Meltwater from the glacier in behind, not shown in the picture. But it also shows you why a penguin has nests. In the Antarctic, penguin nests are not about cushioning, they're not about insulation, they're about a raised platform. And giving space. your eggs a chance, and then your chicks, to sit in something that's not the lowest point where meltwater or melting snow is going to accumulate. Sometimes, of course, the nest just isn't high enough. In this case, these birds failed to breed that summer. Penguins also nest in places that seem weird to us. They walk with those seemingly small legs, waddling and stuff. You'd think they'd come out of the water and nest right on the beach. And they don't do that, though, because there's usually snow right on the beach at the beginning of the summer. When you visit a place like this, and in and, and the time of year we'll be seeing things, it seems odd because there's all of this open real estate with no penguins. Why do they do the long walk to the top of this little hill? And it's because when they came ashore in October, this, the top of this little hill didn't have any snow on it, and everything, every place else did. You can see it uh, happening here in an early November photo. The birds in the foreground here, they're, they're sitting there waiting. They won't lay their eggs on the snow. They have to be on solid ground. Mm -hmm. But the birds that are on that little ridge in the background, well, they're getting a possibly three or four week head start. 
and it's a very short summer, so you want to start as soon as you can. Similar photos from the same place, uh, 10 days apart. And the top, basically look at where the red square is, is the exact spot in both photos. And um, the takeaway is that the bottom photo, 10 days later, has quite a significant amount more of bare ground showing. Now the basic family unit of penguins that we talked about is a mated pair. And when we do a census of penguins, we just, we don't count individual birds, we count mated pairs. For all the species, the males and females look the same with slight differences. The males are usually a little bit taller, a tiny bit heavier. Maybe their beak is a wee bit longer, but it's very hard to tell. And if you haven't been spending time in a colony uh, really seeing a lot of birds, it's hard, to, it's hard to make that judgment call. But the thing about the penguin parents is you need two parents to raise the chicks. And you're going to be doing three main jobs. These will probably seem very familiar to you. Guarding. You've got to keep predators away, like skuas here. And of course, the penguins are going to sit tight and just guard their little spot. You've got to keep your eggs and your chick warm, protected from blizzards and such. And you've got to deliver food to them. And you can't do all of those things by yourself as a penguin parent, because let's say I'm out getting food to bring back to feed my chick. Well, I'm, I'm obviously not guarding and I'm not warming that chick while I'm out getting food. So my partner needs to be there on the nest doing those things while I'm bringing food back. And both male and females swap out those duties quite equally. These two penguin chicks are already locked in mortal combat because they are competing for food from their parents' mouth. And so they're jockeying for position as they beg for food. And the one in front in this photo is winning because he or she, and you can't tell the difference at this stage, he or she has boxed out the sibling, pushed it back in where it can't get its head up to get a clear delivery of food. And what happens is the penguin parent will feed the chick that begs best. They don't divvy it out equally. If you beg better, you get more food. And of course, if you get more food, you grow a little faster, you get a little taller, makes it even easier to outcompete your sibling. But pretty soon, if there's not a lot of food around, one penguin chick will, will wither and starve to death. But in years, when there's a lot of food available, the bird that begs well gets its fill, falls asleep, has a nap, and the parent still has some food available and will feed the one bird that doesn't beg quite so well. And in those years, both chicks will be reared. Now, as they get a little older, they get a little more demanding for food. Here, the penguin has found its mum has come back and is now chasing it, begging for food. And the reason that this bird, the adult here, is running away from its chick is that just out of frame here, there's another couple of chicks chasing because the penguin chicks, they'll beg from any adult. They don't care. They just want food, and they'll beg from anything. But the parents, the parents will only feed their own chicks. And they're really aggressive to those that are not there, their chicks. They can tell the difference, it's remarkable, uh, by their call. And I've spent, you know, months sitting there huddled watching penguins and taking observations and hearing these little cheap, cheap, cheap uh, begging calls. And, you know, for a human, it's, they're, they're all the same. But penguins Only can tell the So at a certain stage when the chicks are cold enough to be able to maintain their own body temperature, with a good down coat on them and a little bit of blubber showing up now, uh, they can sit and wait while both parents go to sea to bring food they back at shorter intervals. And at this stage, the penguin chicks are just kind of sitting around getting meals. Yeah, some of them more successful than others. On a cold day, the penguin chicks from that same area tend to huddle together in a, in a scrum like this to share body heat. But if it's a warm day, they'll spread out. 
Now this is, I say warm day, this was probably 40 degrees Fahrenheit, say three or four degrees Celsius. There was no wind that day. Of course, the sun was shining and these birds super well insulated and they're trying to cool off. So they're lying like this to use their feet as radiators. They get off their feet, flush blood through there and lose Ew. some body heat that way. Now as they grow, they start to try to rub off the down because as I said before, down, great insulator in air, horrible in the water. And this bird you see is molting uh, down as the first year feathers are growing in. And they tend to rub it off wherever they can reach. Obviously the head is one of the tricky spots. If you're a penguin chick, you have to worry about predators basically from the time you're an egg. In the Antarctic, for example, there's a thing called skua. In the temperate areas, there are falcons, there are foxes. There are all kinds of dangers for the chicks. And to take the skua as an example, this is a, a predatory gull-like bird. We've got a nice hook on the beak there. And they often will attack in pairs. Here's two trying to get at this chinstrap penguin nest. Now, here's the beauty of the sit-tight defense. Because if the penguin were to get up to chase one of these skuas, well, clearly the other one is going to just be able to waltz over and grab the chicks. So no, they sit tight and defend what they can reach without getting up. Mm. Hey. Um. In this case, they were successful at driving off the predators, but of course that's not always the case. The skuas are effective. School they take the penguin school chicks school and they do clean them up pretty well because of course they've got chicks to feed too. And if there's anybody here in public relations who wants a real challenge, it would be to rehabilitate the, the public opinion about skuas. Because, of course, they eat cute penguin chicks, but mm. they're just as important a part of the Antarctic ecosystem. Now, in the water, it's a different story. The chicks have to worry about predators on land and in the water, but the adults, who have been feeling pretty safe on land, have to worry when they go into the sea. And of course they have to go into the sea because that's where all their food is. There's a leopard seal just in front of the ice here. Leopard Here's seal. one with the mouth leopard open seal. to show you why. You don't want to just jump in the water. There's a leopard seal around. Leopard seals do eat penguins. Uh, there's a lot of dramatic footage about it. It's not the main part of their diet, but they do, uh, they do eat penguins when they can. They've got quite a large mouth on them. And so they're often patrolling the beaches near penguin colonies because, of course, the penguins have to commute out to sea to get food. In fact, you often find that the penguins come up to the beach or the edge of the ice and they don't just immediately jump in. They, they get there and they wait. And then other penguins come and wait with them and more come and more come. And eventually you get this sort of critical mass of penguins and they all go pouring off. Um, it was written or, or drawn for me like this by some kindergartners who I gave a talk to about penguins. This was on their thank you card. And I think they nailed it pretty well, except they've given each penguin its own ice flow, which is very generous of them. This is the photo that um, got them thinking like that. Um, the penguins are coming out en masse. And the, the idea is that if you're jumping in the water and there's a predator there, you know, if you come in with 40 of your neighbors, the chances of you being the one eaten are reduced. <laughs> this bird that did get bitten, and surprisingly, given the size of the leopard seal mouth, it was not fatally bitten. It managed to get away, it came back to shore and hung around our camp for a few days, uh, and healed up, and then went back out to sea, where of course it has to, because that's where all the food is. Now, penguins live, for the most part, in places that people don't. And so there, many species are free from direct impacts from human civilization. There's a few places in the world where they may have been eaten or their eggs were consumed and stuff. That's barely happening anywhere these days. Um, they're often found on islands that don't get large developments and such. But in different places, they do face different threats. And in fact, out of the formally recognized 18 species, 13 of them are currently considered threatened or in worse shape than that. 
For some, like the Magellanic penguin in South America, their numbers are declining because of changes in how much food they can get during the winter months when they're feeding at, off the coast of Argentina. Or they're swimming in some of the, um, the shipping lanes off the east coast of South America, and they often become uh, fouled with oil that's been spilled, and that kills them by reducing the waterproofness of their feathering. But in some places, it's not even a question of those indirect impacts. It's something even more esoteric, like a change in the climate. Now, this scenario in the Antarctic, what you see here, that's a lot of, a lot of ice in the water. And that's great from a, most penguins' perspective, because ice is a wonderful habitat under which to grow penguin food. And without going into the whole food web here, there's a lot of... Uh, marine algae, the, the, the phytoplankton, and that gets eaten by krill and small fish, and they in turn get eaten by penguins. So this kind of, of seascape is great because it means a lot of room for the growth of the food source. But the distribution of ice is not consistent around the continent. So if we just look at the Adelie penguins, um, all those orange dots on the coastline, each one is a penguin colony. The area oh, yeah, is so I know, I know, I know. at the moment. Numbers are increasing. Circle, they are decreasing. And what's happening basically is a change in the warming temperatures. The Antarctic Peninsula, that area in red, which is where we're headed, is warming much faster than the rest of Antarctica. And that's impacting on the daily penguin populations there. More dramatically, just last year, a study was published that showed a catastrophic loss of emperor penguins in one corner of the Antarctic. This map is showing you sea ice anomalies from 13 months ago. And, and what it, the blue area is, the blue of the area you see, the more ice there is compared to the average amount of, of sea ice. And the redder the areas, that means the less, uh, how much less ice there is compared to the mean. And for the most part, you can see there's one blue zone. But I want to zoom in on the Bellingshausen Sea there, circled the darkest red on the zone here. Because there's a group of emperor penguin colonies nesting down there, and they were affected by the change in the sea ice conditions. Emperor penguins nest on the sea ice, not on land. So they're nesting on a solid bit of ice that's generally protected and connected to the mainland. So it survives the winter and the springtime. And it's a very convenient place to, to breed because it's close to the waterfront where you get all your food. But of course, uh, it's vulnerable to the loss of ice. And in this part of, of the Antarctic coast, um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula landmass that you see here, and where we'll be visiting is kind of off to the top right end, right hand corner of this photo. Um, those different names, Rothschild Island, Verde Peninsula, etc., those are the names of emperor penguin colonies. And all of them failed to raise any chicks last year. And the reason for that is that the ice disappeared early. While the chicks were still wearing down coats, and therefore not waterproof, and therefore unable to survive being immersed in the Southern Ocean. Uh, these two photos are of the exact same area. Uh, on the left, inside that little circle, you see a dark smudge at the very middle of the circle. That is the penguin colony, as seen by satellite photo. And if you look at the icebergs that are casting shadows there, uh, they, those icebergs are in the exact same positions in the right-hand side photo. The black that you see in the right-hand photo, all of that black area is open water. Hmm. So over the course of two months, hmm. right, this yeah. ice has all disappeared. And this is a crucial time for it to disappear because the chicks are not waterproof at that stage of their lives. Oh. And so close to 10,000 yeah, chicks died as a result of this change in sea yeah, ice. Yeah. Now these kind of changes well, they're unprecedented. We haven't seen them before. Uh, but as the trend continues with warming down there, uh, we may see this sort of thing happening again. And it's why it's 
it's very challenging to take a, a bird like penguins that are so well adapted to live in harsh environment to withstand the cold to to make a living in a place that we can't imagine it uh, when suddenly the conditions turn to look something like this that's not a good thing for them it's beautiful for us uh. blue bird day but not a great place to live if you're counting on things being very cold now the penguins around the world continue to enthrall people. I know many of you are, are looking forward to doing an excursion in the next few days. We are able to see penguins on excursions uh, in Puerto Madryn, in Punta Arenas, in Ushuaia, in Stanley, and also from the ship itself, as our expedition leader, Dr. Norman Laska, mentioned earlier this morning with the introductions, if you've got binoculars, please bring them with you when you go out on deck. It'll help bring things in closer. But we're, we're already in the zone of penguins. So as we approach the, uh, the port tomorrow, for example, those of you who spend time out on deck might get a chance to see Magellanic penguins porpoising along in the water. So it's time to get excited about penguins, even if you're one of the two or three people who did raise your hand and said you hated them. I, I hope you'll at least uh, appreciate them a little bit more from this presentation. Thanks very much. Hello. There you are.